If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Daniel chapter 9. The lesson tonight is going to conclude... Really, it is a it, it really is continuation of what we talked about in class this morning. But certainly we're dealing with a very important and often misunderstood area of Scripture. As we think about Daniel 9, the backdrop for our lesson tonight, it records for us a marvelous prayer on the part of Daniel to God, not just on his own behalf, but on behalf of the nation of Israel as well, recognizing the sins that they had committed against God, but also recognizing the majestic and righteous nature of God and and His forgiving nature, that He is a God of great mercies and forgiveness. And certainly in this prayer, as we study, Daniel supplicates, beseeches God, having confessed national and personal sin, to turn their captivity having in mind the prophecy of Jeremiah regarding the captivity and desolation of Jerusalem in mind in Jeremiah 29, verse number 10. And God, who is faithful in hearing the prayers of His righteous people, certainly heard and responded. And and that's where we come tonight as we approach our study of Daniel chapter 9 tonight. We look at Daniel chapter 9, verses 20 through 23, and really all the way down through verse 27, you have... God's response to Daniel's prayer. In verse number 20, you have the situation that Daniel was continuing to confess sin and to pray for God's holy mountain, which contextually would be Jerusalem. But then you come to verse number 21 here, and you look at the interruption. While Daniel was continuing in prayer, Gabriel, whom Daniel encountered in chapter 8, was sent by God to respond to Daniel's prayer. Notice this was immediately. The idea of flying swiftly indicates that this was an immediate response. Upon arriving, Gabriel, noticing that Daniel is continuing in prayer, interrupts Daniel by simply touching him. And this prayer was taking place around the time of the evening oblation or sacrifice, which was, which, which was made prior to captivity in the temple, which was around the ninth hour. In modern day time, it would be around 3 o'clock p.m. In captivity, Daniel engaged in prayer during the time these sacrifices were to be made. And certainly, this helps us appreciate the faith and reverence Daniel had for God in his worship. And then you look in verse number 22, you have the declaration on the part of Gabriel that he was letting Daniel know the purpose as to why he was there. He was going to reveal to Daniel the answer God had in mind for him, to show him that the future of the temple in Jerusalem went far beyond the 70 years of captivity. And then you look at verse number 23, the origination of the answer. Notice Gabriel tells him, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came Forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Now, as soon the answer came was coming as soon as Daniel began to pray. That's the idea here. Not waiting till the prayer was finished, God had his response to Daniel on the way. And so, what God te- Gabriel tells Daniel here is that he in, it, is that he had God's authority, and that he that is Gabriel was being obedient to the command God had given, that he had received from God. And further, you look at the text, Gabriel tells Daniel how God felt of him, that he was well beloved of God due to his faithfulness. But in order to understand the matter, as Gabriel told Daniel, Daniel was going to have to apply himself in order to understand what was going to be told. And isn't there, isn't there a great application in this for today? That if we're going to understand God's Word, we're going to have to apply ourselves in diligent study. Again, that's why Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, to give diligence, to study, to show thyself approved unto God. We're not going to know God's Word without diligent effort. And so it is, we now come to verses 24 through 27. The answer is in the form of a prophecy. And it is a prophecy that is referred to as the 70 weeks. And it is a section of Scripture, no doubt, that is difficult in nature 
In fact, many false doctrines have resulted due to misunderstanding of this prophecy. But I would suggest to you tonight that it is one of the most beautiful sections of Scripture and that it presents to us a panoramic portrait of the work of Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, in coming to this earth. In our study tonight, we're going to take a twofold approach. First of all, we're going to look at the mission of the Messiah in light of what is said here in the text. And then we're going to examine the chronology of the prophecy and its fulfillment. We will thus show from our study that all things prophesied in this text have been fulfilled by and through Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior, the one sent from God, from heaven. And I hope that our study tonight will give us a greater appreciation for the sacrifice that Christ made, the new covenant we enjoy under Him, and the blessings that are made possible through and in Him that we as Christians enjoy and that we desire all to enjoy today as well. So, with that in mind, first of all, think with me about the mission of the Messiah. Verses 24 and 25. You, you look down here now in verse number 25. And, and, and Gabriel specifically uses the term, uses the name, the Messiah. Now, the, the term Messiah means anointed or anointed one. In, uh, in Isaiah 45, in verse number 1, it is said that Cyrus, king of Persia, was God's anointed. That is, Cyrus would release the Jews from captivity. In a sense, he was, but for a specific purpose. Here in Daniel 9, we are dealing with a very different individual. We are dealing with the Christ. In fact, the term Christ in the Greek is Christos, meaning anointed and both designated designative names Christ and Messiah are synonymous we do no violence to the text in verse 25 if we say the Christ rather than Messiah because they mean the same thing so when you look at Daniel 9 verse 25 and you see the phrase the Messiah think of the Christ Jesus the Christ because this is who we are dealing with in this particular passage. But now, what was the purpose in Jesus coming to earth? Why did, you know, we often sing the song, Why did my Savior come to earth? Why did Jesus come to earth? What does this prophecy give, present to us regarding the earthly mission of Christ? Well, number one, to deal with the problem of sin. And notice in the text, four phrases are used. used. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. He would then be cut off, but not for himself, and to usher in an era of righteousness. And as we think about the work of him, verse 24 emphasizes the main problem humanity has, and that is sin. Verse 24, though while we often look at the difficult section, let's not forget verse 24 because it deals with man's fundamental problem, sin, transgression, iniquity. And its seriousness here is emphasized as well. Verse 26 then emphasizes what the Messiah, what Christ had to do in order to make possible these things. He had to be cut off. And this corresponds with Isaiah 53, verse 8. To be cut off is to be put to death. Now let us examine this further. First of all, as we think about the description of why it came, let's think about the problems. Transgression. Well, that's sin, and sin is transgression of God's law in light of 1 John 3, in verse number 4. And further, iniquity is lawlessness. Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 59, verse 2, that sin, our sins, our iniquities, separate us from God. That's the problem. Now, what's the solution? Christ had to come. He had to live the sin-free life so that He would be that perfect lamb without spot and without blemish. And He had to be cut off. He had to be put to death. 
In fact, you go all the way back to the first prophecy pertaining to Christ, Genesis 3, verse 15, that he would be born of the seed of woman and that the serpent would bruise his heel. That's an allusion to the death of Christ. That it was Satan, Satan was involved in that as well. Though it was planned by God and purposed by God. Then you look throughout the Old Testament, the top... The, the books of Exodus, Leviticus, the sacrifices that were made under the old law, these sacrifices serve as a type of the greater sacrifice that was to be made by Jesus Christ. Remember what the Hebrews writer said in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1, that the law served as a shadow of good things to come. These sacrifices served as a shadow of the good sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice, to be made by Christ Jesus. In fact, the blood of bulls and goats serve as a type or a shadow of the blood that Christ shed. Then, of course, who can forget Isaiah chapter 53? A vivid prophecy of Christ's crucifixion. And think about in this prophecy here in Daniel 9 corresponds. In Isaiah 53 verse 8, Isaiah foresaw the Messiah being cut off out of the land of the living. And here Daniel sees, Gabriel tells Daniel that the Messiah is going to be cut off. In a lot of ways, Isaiah 53 and Daniel chapter 9 fit together as well as Je Jeremiah 33. But now, understanding he had to be cut off, what would be the results? What would Christ, what would the benefits be for you and I of the Messiah being cut off from the land of the living. Well, number one, he would finish the transgression. He would make possible complete atonement for sin. That is, complete covering and forgiveness. And this deals with all transgression being sealed from God's, God's sight by the work of the Messiah. He would make an end of sins. What the blood of bulls and goats could not do, and that is provide remission in light of Hebrews 10 verse 4. What the blood of bulls and goats could not do, the blood of Christ can do. Can do. It provides us with full remission. Isaiah 53 verse 10 tells us that Christ was made that perfect offering for sin. And Paul affirmed in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 that Christ was indeed made a sin offering. And then you look at the Ephesian letter. When Paul told the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 1, in verse number 7, that it is in whom, in Christ, we have redemption. Notice this. In Christ we have redemption through His blood. Well, when did He shed His blood? When He was cut off out of the land of the living. And thus, as a result of His being cut off, it is through Christ, in Christ, through Him, through His blood, we have redemption. Even the forgiveness of sins. So where does we contact that cleansing blood? Romans 6, 3 and 4, by getting into His death. By faith we are immersed into Christ, into His death. We are buried with Him in baptism into His death. And we contact the blood by, blood by faith. In fact, when we enter the water, when we are immersed, God goes to work. The blood goes to work because that is the operation of God. Colossians 2, verse number 12. And as a result, when we arise out of that watery grave, we are a new creation, a new creature in Christ. We are made to walk in newness of life, having put to death the old man of sin, having buried him, in that watery grave. And thus we begin a new life in Christ Jesus. And as we walk in the light, as He is in the light, as John tells us there in 1 John 1, His precious blood continually cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's one of the great benefits that Christ offers all mankind as a result of His being cut off. He would make reconciliation for iniqui iniquity. To reconcile is to, to change from enmity to friendship. When we sin against God, we are separated from God. And, and, and see now what we're doing. 
you know, we look at this prophecy before we go on. We look at this prophecy and we allow the no, numerology of the prophecy to bamboozle us. We're going to look at the numerology here in a moment. But while, while people get bamboozled by it, they are forgetting the beautiful, beautiful thoughts, the beautiful concepts that are set forth here regarding why Christ came to this earth. To make our reconciliation to God possible. In fact, Paul tell, told, tells us in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are reconciled unto God as a result of the cross. We are reconciled unto God in the one body, which is the church, through the blood of the cross. As Paul put it there in Colossians chapter 1. This reconciliation takes place in Christ, in His church, the one body. And it is un, unto us as Christians today. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. That's what it's all about, the gospel. And we preach and we teach the word of reconciliation. God wants to reconcile all men unto Him. And all men can be reconciled unto God if they obey the gospel. And again, isn't this a beautiful portrait that that God is allowing Daniel to see several hundred years before. Just as Isaiah saw the death of Christ, Daniel here is seeing the end results of that death as well. The, the possibility of iniquity, of reconciliation to God. Not just for the Jews, but for Gentiles, for all mankind. For God so loved the world. That He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But God commended His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Some beautiful thoughts here. God's answer to Daniel regarding forgiveness is that He is going to take care of the sin problem in one fell swoop. And it's going to occur with the death of my anointed. My only begotten Son, the Je Jesus the Christ. And it is through Him all have the possibility of being saved, of being forgiven of their sins and trespasses. He would come to, to usher in an era of everlasting righteousness. In purchasing His church with His blood, Christ ushered in a new era characterized by righteousness. And this theme is dealt with in a complete and comprehensive manner by the Apostle Paul in his Roman letter. The gospel of Christ is revelation of the righteousness of God. Think about what Paul said there in Romans chapter 1. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed, from faith unto faith, for as it is written, the just shall live by faith. In other words, Daniel is seeing the gospel, the Christian age. He would also seal up the vision and prophecy, and it's a twofold idea here. One, this points to the end of the Old Testament revelation. The message of the old pointed to the Christ. In time, with, again, within the framework of the 70 weeks, the visions and prophecies of the Old Testament would be fulfilled. They would no longer be open or waiting on its fulfillment. Further, the message of the new is that Christ has come and God speaks today through and only through His Son, Christ Jesus. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. But number two, this could also apply to when the gospel system had begun and the Lord's will was revealed and confirmed in that inspired revelation would cease. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8, 8 and following. Whichever case it was, Christ did fulfill this. But then number, as well, He came to be anointed, to anoint the most holy. Isaiah prophesied that Christ would be anointed to preach the glad tidings. Isaiah 61. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus applies the anointing that Christ spoke of to himself. Jesus is God's anointed. In fact, he was anointed by God, the proof that the Holy Spirit descended on him 
at his baptism. And Matthew chapter 4 confirms this to be so. And this is further verified when Peter preached to the household of Cornelius. In Acts chapter 10, when Peter affirmed that God anointed Christ with the Holy Spirit and with power. We are not left up to chance as to who we are dealing with in this text. Further, he would make a firm covenant with many, or should confirm the covenant with many. Indeed, we the new and better covenant which the Hebrews writer emphasizes, he is, is the one that Christ made. And it makes it possible for man to enjoy forgiveness, to enjoy the remission of sins that is found only in Christ Jesus. That's the mission of the Messiah. And aren't you glad God sent him? Aren't you glad the Father sent him on this mission? Aren't you glad that he completed this mission? I know I am. And I know every one of us sitting in here tonight should be as well. Now, with that said, let's look at the chronology of the prophecy. Here's, here's where the fun, fun begins. We can pinpoint some of this. And, and, and again, we're seeing with this time frame given precision on the part of God. He's saying, here's what's going to happen. And it's on my own timetable. And I'm going to give you a glimpse at this timetable. You look at the time frame in verse number 24. Gabriel tells Daniel, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy place. Now, 70 weeks, a day equals a year. So, 70 times 7 equals 490 years. And it is divided. This particular prophecy is divided into three segments. First of all, you have seven weeks, which corresponds to 49 years. Then you have the second section, which is 62 weeks or 434 years. And then finally, you have the one week, which equals seven years. And emphasis is placed especially on the middle of that week. As we think about this, some believe, that, you know, there. There's a lot of speculation. There are those who, have, who claim this is just a literal 70 weeks. Well, that doesn't fit this time frame. This could be also symptomatic of seven, 70 times 7, which is possibility. Remember, 7 is the number of perfection or completion. And then God would choose 70 to convey in symbolic language as to when Christ would come into the world, the, the fullness of the time. But I think we're also dealing with 490 literal years as well, with each week, with each week, with each day standing for one year in each week. Seven, seven days in a week, so you're dealing with seven years in a week. Now, when did this begin? Can we know when this time frame began? Absolutely. Look at verse 25. Look at verse 25. Now, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So Gabriel clearly identifies the beginning point here from the going forth of the command to restore Jerusalem. And there are several possibilities. Would it be with the decree of Cyrus around at 536 in Ezra chapter 1, verse number 1 and following, for the Jews to return to the, to the temple? Well, this would not fit the time frame for the life of Christ if this was the case. The decree of Ezra chapter 1 would end the 70 weeks between 55 and 48 B.C. What A couple of decades before Christ, several decades before Christ came on the scene. But then you go to Ezra chapter 6 in verse number 1 and following. Could it be with the decree of Darius to complete the temple, which would be some 16 years later? Well, this would put the, the, the end between 30 and 23 B.C., so the time's still short. Well, what about Nehemiah? When he led, the, when he, when he led a group of Jews back to, to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls around 444 in his book bearing his name. Well, this would place the weeks ending some 12 years after Christ's death. But then the scriptures give us another one. You look at Ezra chapter 7. Notice this. These are all, these are all possibilities in the scriptures. 
We're going to the scriptures for what, when, when this began. What about Ezra chapter 7, verses 11 through 28? When Artaxerxes sent a letter to Ezra to take what he, would, what he needed for the service of the house of God. This would be around 457 B.C. at this time, at the time Ezra 7 was written. Well, this would have the time frame ending around 30 A.D., which would coincide with the year that Christ was crucified. So, I would suggest Ezra chapter 7. The decree found in Ezra chapter 7 kickstarts this time frame. Now, you, let's, let's look at this. Let's look at the division. Now, understanding when it begins, let's look at the duration. The seven weeks, the 49 years, deals with the period of the actual rebuilding of the city and the, during troublous times. This is confirmed for us in the book of Nehemiah. Remember, remember when Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem? And the struggles he and his fellow Jews faced in the rebuilding of the walls. Remember, remember how they all had a mind to work, but they had to work with tools in one hand and a sword in the other because of adversaries from the Samaritans such as Tobias and Sanballat who sought to hinder their work for the Lord. This, 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 that's fulfillment. They indeed rebuilt Jerusalem during very turbulent, during very troublous times. Now, the 62 weeks, which is 434 years, deals with the period of settlement, the period of silence between the, te between the testaments, and takes us to the time in which Christ began, came to this earth. That's the 62. Now, most importantly, we've got to deal with the one week in the middle of the week, which is the seven years. And this brings the total up to 490. This includes the time of Christ. It includes His death, His burial, His resurrection. It would also include the teaching of the gospel to the Jews until the conversion of the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8, even though you can make the case as well with some overlapping in the historical account of Acts that we could include the conversion of Cornelius and his household in this as well. However, you look at this period of time, Jesus would be rejected by the Jews, delivered up to be crucified at the hands of the Romans, with thus fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy and the prophecy here in Daniel chapter 9. So that's the one week. Now, what about the termination? When would it be completed? Well, the people of the prince, after the Christ was put to death, after the good news of salvation was preached, the people of the prince would come and destroy the city. That is Jerusalem. Again, Jerusalem would be destroyed. But this occurred after the seventh week. It occurred after the 70 weeks occurred, lapsed, which if we are correct was seven years. During, that time, that during the first half of the last week, the three, three and a half years, is when Christ came to teach, preach, and die. And wouldn't you know it that his earthly ministry was three, some, a little over three years? Three and a half years. That's interesting, is it? God in his foresight. Again, we are seeing precision that man couldn't have came up with. Again, seeing this prophecy fulfilled is again further evidence for the inspiration of the Bible. During the second half of this seven years, the second, the second three and a half years, there would be enough time to preach the gospel to the Jews and even go to Cornelius and his household. It is possible that it was three and a half years between the time of Pentecost until Acts chapter 8, and even beyond that as well, when the gospel was preached to the Samaritans. And even if we include... Cornelius and his household. And that you can make the case as well of Matthew 24, 15, when Christ said the gospel would be preached in all the world before the abomination of desolation, that the gospel would be taken into all the world. Indeed it did, Colossians 1, verse 23. But the last half of this week ended long before Jerusalem's destruction in A.D. 70 at the hands of the Romans. It was in the midst of this week that Christ caused the sacrifice to cease. Reference to Christ fulfilling the law. 
nailing it to his cross, taking it out of the way, bringing in a new and better system, a new and better covenant, the New Testament. Now, during this time, from the old to the new, Jews still made sacrifices, but after Christ died, these were not accepted by God due to the establishment of the new covenant and abolishment of the old. The Jewish rejection of the people of the Christ and the gospel is what paved the way for the destruction once again of Jerusalem at the hands of the people of the prince and the overspreading of abominations as Daniel is told here in Daniel 9 verses 26 and 27. That destruction occurred after all the preceding took place. Thus, this prophecy has been fulfilled completely by Christ and through His heralds of the gospel. Daniel chapter 9, as we have studied tonight, is a most intriguing, fascinating, and I would suggest encouraging section of Scripture in the entirety of Holy Writ. Because it presents to us a picture of the work of the Word made flesh, the Christ. It presents to us a picture of the blessings He offers as a result of His time here on earth. Reconciliation to God. Forgiveness of sins. The blessings offered under this new covenant. It presents to us a picture of the gospel age. It presents to us a picture of the faithfulness of God in fulfilling His promises. Daniel 9 is indeed set in a dark period of time for Daniel and Israel. But this section reveals a coming day when the Jews would be set free from captivity. But even more importantly, it gave Daniel a glimpse at a coming day when people could be made free from the captivity that sin brings through the proclamation of the message of the new covenant that the Messiah ushered in as a result of His work gives us a picture of Pentecost. On that day when Peter preached the gospel, 3,000 souls were added by the Lord to his church on that day. The terms of, in, the terms of salvation were set forth on that day in Acts 2.38, which includes baptism, as we've talked about in this lesson. More than 500 years before the fullness of the time arrived, here in Daniel 9, God revealed to His faithful servant with amazing precision that the Messiah would arrive at the appointed time to offer Himself as that perfect sacrifice for sin, to establish that new and better covenant which would usher in everlasting righteousness. Understanding this prophecy and its fulfillment strengthens our faith in God, strengthens our faith in Christ, strengthens our faith in the written Word, in the powerful message we proclaim today, and the blessings available through obedience to His teachings. Where would we be without this prophecy? Where would we be if Messiah hadn't come into this world at the exact right time in history? And, I, and that's an overarching lesson that we learned from the 70 weeks, is that this occurred at the exact right time in history. If He hadn't come, we would be lost. We would be dead in trespasses and sins. Thankful, thank, thank God that He did send His Son to die for our, for our sins. May we ever be thankful for the blessings we enjoy as a result of His being made flesh. Tonight as a Christian, do you appreciate these blessings? Are you living faithfully? If you're not living faithfully, rededicate your life to God. Rededicate your life to Christ this evening. You know what you need to do. If you need to respond to heaven's invitation, we encourage you to do that right now. As together we stand, as we sing.